Good evening, everyone. You know, a couple hours ago, uh, I had a phone call from overseas. And uh, there's a gentleman on the line uh, in a foreign country <coughs> over in the South Pacific. And uh, he's struggling. He's uh, been, been drinking for a long, long time. And um, so he, I had met him when I was overseas, and he said, I don't know what to do. I, for three-fourths of my life, I've been drinking. And um, he said, what should I do? He said, I know I have a problem. I said, well... First thing is, you've got to get as far away from alcohol as you can and, and get into a facility where you can just dry out, where you don't have any alcohol around you. Get as far away from it as you can. <clears throat> and then I said, you've, you've got to um, just fill your mind with the promises of God. Because it's the promises of God's Word that are going to empower you to resist that temptation. And I said then, not only when you go into a rehab, you dry out, but also you're going to have to build some new pathways in your mind so that whenever the thought of alcohol comes into your mind, you create a new pathway where you praise God and say, Lord, I've been a slave to this, but you're going to give me the victory. And I'm going to win because you have the power to help me overcome. And uh, he said, Bill, that's exactly what I'll do. That's what I'll do. And you know, he, he said something to me that... He said, do you remember all those times before you'd be leaving out in the wee hours of the morning? to go get your plane. Do you remember when, when we used to talk? And I said, yeah, I remember those times. And uh, he said, you know, I was drinking all, that, all the time we were talking. And uh, he said, but there was something, there was, there was some hope that I always had after we spoke together. And, you know, as... When he said that, it, it kind of made me, it startled me. But then when I got off the phone after we had prayer together, I thought, where is their hope? Where is their hope in this world today? There, there's no hope in, in any human system. None. No system anywhere in this world today is their hope. There's no hope in in uh, Catholicism, in apostate Protestantism, in Adventism, in apostate Adventism. But where is their hope? Well, it's right here. You know, Joel, Joel chapter 3, verse 16. Joel chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of His people and the strength of the children of Israel. Ah, uh, there's hope in Christ Jesus tonight. Abundant, abundant hope tonight in Christ Jesus. You know, in Zach, <clears throat> excuse me, Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 12. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 12. Zechariah declared to Zerubbabel and the returning captives from Babylon. Zechariah 9, verse 12. He said, Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. We're confined to this world, aren't we? We're enclosed. We're, we're trapped, as it were, in this world, behind bars called humanity. 
And Zacharias said, Turn to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. This isn't the end, folks. This is the beginning. And when the Lord comes, He's going to shatter the prison doors of our mortality, of our feebleness, and He will help us to rise, to meet Him in the air. Praise the Lord tonight. Turn ye to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. And praise God tonight that we have the opportunity to know that in Christ Jesus there is hope. And we can share that with humanity. Praise the Lord. You know, like to look at something with you this evening. It's called Fundamentalism, Apologies, and Trump. Basically, I just want to look at some current events in the light of Bible prophecy with you. Um, I have people all the time asking me, you know, when is there going to be a Sunday law? And my answer is, is that no human being knows time. That's not ours to know. It could happen, it could happen next week. You realize that it could. If we had a terror attack tonight or tomorrow, we could have it very quickly. You know, after Oklahoma City in 1995, Bill Clinton's anti-terrorism legislation, it was, it was just plodding along like, you know, soldiers with boots in the mud, in the slime. It was going nowhere after Oklahoma City. That anti-terrorism bill went through Congress with, with grease lightning. Grease lightning, folk. And a terror attack on U.S. soil, an economic collapse, some, some event could trigger a Sunday loss so quick it'd make our heads spin. So am I setting time? No. Nobody knows time. A Sunday law could come in another year. Could come in three years. Could come in five years. We don't know time. God knows time. So we need to leave it in His hands. But... Are there events going on in our world today that should have our tentacles up? Yeah, there are. There are. We're going to look at a few of those this evening. Probably some of you remember um, back in January of a year ago, there was a satirical newspaper in Paris, France called Charlie Hebdo. And uh, many people were shot and killed in that newspaper facility. Um, and then, of course, in November, also in the city of Paris and the outlying areas, on a, I think it was a Friday evening, uh, there was more terror that took place in France, and uh, many more people passed away. Folk, when we watch events like this occur, and we seem to be seeing them more and more often, and closer and closer to home, we need to look and step back when an event takes place and say, who benefits from what happened? What is the fallout from the event that occurred? See, when you look at Oklahoma City or September 11, 2001, in both cases, with Oklahoma City, it was Timothy McVeigh that was accused of doing that. But of course, the bombs that were placed within the building that were at key junctures in the Murrah building, his Ryder truck could never, his ammonium nitrate bomb could never have caused the damage. So you sit back 
and you say, okay, what happened after Oklahoma City? Well, Bill Clinton's anti-terrorism laws. And those laws, friends, seriously gutted constitutional freedoms that we have. Based on Bill Clinton's anti-terrorism legislation after Oklahoma City, if the federal government wanted to enforce that this evening, they could walk into this building and arrest me because the anti-terrorism legislation says that you cannot believe in conspiracy theories. Okay? Now that, that's one of the things in that anti-terrorism legislation. Now friend, does Timothy McVeigh, did he care anything about Bill Clinton's legislation that, that destroys the Constitution? Timothy McVeigh could care less. But who could benefit... Who benefits when the Constitution comes under attack? Who hates the Constitution? Does Timothy McVeigh? No, he doesn't. He could care less about the Constitution. The papacy hates the United States Constitution. From the very beginning, the very thought of a nation that would espouse freedoms, Protestant freedoms, was absolutely horrible in the eyes of Rome. Because now it was Rome against the Constitution. Protestant liberty versus Roman tyranny. So who benefited from Oklahoma City? Well, all those who hated the United States Constitution benefited. And one of those that benefited was the Roman Catholic Church. Now, how about after September 11th? Who benefited? What happened after 9-11? The New Patriot Act. Which sometimes, as I told the story before, when sometimes when people call me on the phone, they say, uh, we'd like to order some of your books about the Jays. And I'll say... Uh, I'm sorry, sir, ma'am, I didn't write any books about birds. And they'll say, no, I'm not talking about those kinds of jays. I'm talking about, you know, the real kinds of jays. I said, no, I'm only familiar with the jays that fly. And then I'll say to them, oh, you mean the books I wrote about the Jesuits and the Catholic Church and what they're doing to destroy religious liberty in America? And they'll say, uh, uh, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Why do people do that? Because of the New Patriot Act. They're afraid. So who benefited from, from September? Did, did the Islamic world benefit from September? No, they didn't benefit. But through the New Patriot Act, anybody and everybody that, dis that hates the Constitution... They benefited. There was a message that was sent after those two terror attacks. So what was the message that came out of the terror that took place in Paris and Charlie Hebdo? What happened in the aftermath? Well, Pope Francis, Pope Francis made these comments. He denounced the religious fundamentalism that inspired the Paris massacres and ongoing Mideast conflicts, saying the attackers were enslaved by deviant forms of religion that used God as a mere ideological pretext to perpetuate mass killings. Francis called for a unanimous response from the international community to end fundamentalist terrorism in the Mideast. He called for Muslim leaders in particular to condemn extremist interpretations of their faith that seek to justify such violence. Now that was in January of last year. Did you notice what Francis 
in response to what happened in Paris. He did it both times after both attacks. He said the cause of it was fundamentalism. Do you know what a fundamentalist is? A fundamentalist is somebody who simply believes what their holy book says. If your holy book says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, a fundamentalist simply says, well, the Bible says to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy, which is Saturday, therefore, I will go to church on the seventh day Sabbath. That's a fundamentalist. And Francis said that the cause for those terror attacks were because of religious fundamentalists. Now he also condemned people that followed deviant forms of religion. Do you know what deviant forms of religion are? Different forms of religion. Religion that is simply different from the status quo. So if, if the status quo says we go to church on Sunday or the status quo says when you die you go to heaven or you go to hell. Well if somebody comes along and says well I go to church on Sabbath, Saturday or I believe that when you die you sleep you're a deviant. You're a deviant. So Pope Francis took the terror attacks that according to Revelation 18.24 Babylon the Great was behind them. And he used those attacks to go on the attack against religious fundamentalists. And to begin to create a mindset in the world that says Watch out for people that take a literal interpretation of their holy book. Watch out for them. Now the other thing that Francis did is he called for the international community to unite together to oppose these atrocities. Now, I had a letter recently from Portland, Oregon. We did a mass mailing out there of one of my books. And a lady wrote in to us, didn't leave her name and address, which is typical. But she said, I read your book with interest. But as I read through, I realized that you as a Christian organization were attacking another Christian organization. And she said, shouldn't we be using our time and money to oppose the common enemy of Christendom? Now what did she mean by that? She said that I was a Christian. And that I was attacking another Christian group. And who was she saying was that other Christian group? The papacy. She said, we're not supposed to be talking about other Christian groups. We should be uniting together to oppose the enemy. And who in her mind is the enemy? Islam. That's right, Joe. Islam. Folks, do you see what's going on in our world right before our eyes? Right before our eyes, the world is being told all Christian groups must unite together. Come together because we have to unite together to oppose the enemy. Well, folks, as a Seventh-day Adventist, that should just send us in alarm. Because that means that the world is calling on Roman Catholics, apostate Protestants, and Seventh-day Adventists, and the rest of the world to unite against Islam. You ready to do that? 
You ready to unite with Roman Catholics to oppose the common enemy? Are we ready to adopt the position of this lady in this letter that said that Roman Catholicism is a Christian organization? Do you believe that? Is the Pope a Christian? Is he a pretty good guy? You see, folk, within Seventh-day Adventism, I would imagine many of us have on our shelves a two-volume set called God Cares. Do any of you have those books? God Cares by Dr. Mervyn Maxwell? Do you have those? You have it, Eddie. Yeah, I do too. The first volume is on the book of Daniel. The second volume is on the book of Revelation. They're called God Cares. And in many ways, the books are very good. There's a lot of good material in there. But it's fascinating to me when Dr. Maxwell talks about the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7. Do you know what he calls the little horn of Daniel chapter 7? He calls them Christian Rome. When did Roman Catholicism become Christian? Never. They're not Christian. You know, in another book that I have on my shelf back home, see, so this isn't just something that's going on over in Paris or over in the Middle East. This is going on within Seventh-day Adventism. George Vandeman, wrote a book back in the mid-1980s. I have it on my shelf at home. It's called The Rise and Fall of the Antichrist. And in the chapter where it's called The Antichrist Revealed, George Vandeman says, you know, it's, it's too bad that Christians killed Christians during the Dark Ages. And he said, we shouldn't be too hard on the Christians of the Dark Ages because they built hospitals, they cared for the poor, and they preserved the Bible. Now that's what George Vandeman said. That was back 30 years ago, friend. 30 years ago. Now, whatever happened to the Waldenses? The great, the noble, the courageous Waldenses in the Piedmont Valleys of northern Italy. Whatever happened to them? The Vaudois, they were called. The Israel of the Alps that were slaughtered. How about the Albigenses and the Huguenots of France? Whatever happened to those brave, noble men and women who stood for the Lord Jesus Christ for centuries and were mowed down like grass? And yet we would call Roman Catholics, Roman Catholicism, Christian? It's a joke. It's a joke. Now, folk, are we are we here denouncing and saying every Roman Catholic is evil? Of course not. It's not the people. There are many lovely, beautiful Roman Catholics who are living up to all the light they know. Just like the general that I was telling you about last night and his two assistants, they're studying the truth of Daniel and Revelation. You know, there were a few nuns over there in uh, one of the countries of Africa. I don't remember which country. But they started listening to the radio And they, they were listening to the studies that we had done on the book of Daniel. And they were absolutely convinced that the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 was the papal power. 
uh, one day as they were listening to their radios, their uh, their mother, their uh, what do they call her? Oh, the mother superior. That's it. Thank you, Yolanda. The mother superior. She caught them. She caught them listening to the radio programs, listening to studies in Daniel and Revelation and the Gospels and other places. She was furious. She brought those young nuns in and she said, what are you doing listening to that heretic? Oh, but I thought Rome has changed. I thought they were now Christians, aren't they? That's what we're told. Mother Superior said, don't you ever listen to that heretic again. And one nun, one nun had the audacity to say, Mother Superior, I have one question for you. She said, who is the little horn of Daniel chapter 7? Who's the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 that claims to be God on earth, claims He can forgive sins, Ruled from 538 to 1798. And as this young nun is asking the mother superior questions, her face is getting redder and redder and redder. Till finally she explodes. She says, get out of my sight! And they exiled these nuns to a very, very remote area in Africa. So folk, there are dear Roman Catholics that are living up to all the light they have, which is basically none. But the Lord will find ways to reach them. Even through little radio stations in Africa. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Pope Francis, after what happened in Paris in November, he said, fundamentalism, he's getting stronger. He's getting stronger. This happened three months ago. Fundamentalism is a disease that is in all religions. It's a disease, friend. If you accept the Bible as it reads, you're sick. You're sick. That's what he's saying. Amen. Amen. We Catholics, we have some, some many who believe they have the absolute truth and go on dirtying others with slander and libel and they hurt, they hurt. Do you know any any church, are, are you familiar with any group that believes they have the absolute truth? Do you know any group like that? Yeah. I think I think the group I'm thinking of, they don't call it absolute truth. They call it present truth. So what would Pope Francis call people that believe in present truth? What would he call them? They're diseased. They're diseased. Praise the Lord, I'll be diseased. I say this because it's, It is my church. We, everyone, you have to fight. Religious fundamentalism is not religious. Why? Because there's God. Idolatrous as is idolatrous money. But fundamentalism that always ends in a tragedy or crime, it's a bad thing. But there's a bit in all religions. You know, friend, there's... do, do Do you sense in that statement... Fear. Do you sense in that statement desperation? I do. Because there's one thing Pope Francis realizes he can't stop. There's one thing that's bigger than Pope Francis. And that is somebody who will accept what this book says. And will follow what this book says. He is petrified. He is petrified of a group of people that will take this book as it reads and will seek by the grace of God to live it and to share it with the world. He's petrified of that people. Will you be one of those people? Are you one of those people tonight? 
the Lord wants to make us, friend, into a mighty army. As Song of Solomon, not a book that we read very often, but Song of Solomon chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? God's people, when we're in submission to the Word of God, and we are holding on to that word regardless of what's going on around us, nothing can stop. Nothing can stop God's children. Nothing. And Francis knows that. He knows that. Religious fundamentalism, the definition, it says a form of religion, especially Islam or Protestant Christianity, that upholds belief in the strict literal interpretation of Scripture, strict adherence to the basic principles of any subject or discipline. Are you a religious fundamentalist? Ellen White talks about religious fundamentalists in Great Controversy, page 595. She says, but God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord in its Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in the place of God. He leads the people to look to bishops, to pastors, to professors of theology as their guides. Instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves. Then by controlling the minds of these leaders, he can influence the multitudes according to his will. Great Controversy 595. God will have a people that will maintain the authority of Scripture. And friend, it is your privilege and my privilege this evening to recommit ourselves to being that people. That people. What the devil fears most people that will pray, people that will study, people that will share. They are like an army. An army. Pope Francis also, in the last several months, has been doing a lot of apologizing for the sins and offenses committed by the Catholic Church against indigenous peoples during the colonial era conquest of the Americas. Let's see now, that's about what? 500, 500 years ago? Well, it sounds like Rome's changing, doesn't it? Sounds like Pope Francis is, you know, he's, he's, he's really sorry for, you know, what the church did. Great Controversy 571 kind of tears the mask right off his face and says, you know, this is a big game. The Roman Church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. 
the papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. She possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. You know, I will never forget a Q&A we had here a few years ago. A lady stood up during the question and answer period right here in this church and she said, you know, a few months ago, I was at the university church and a Jesuit priest was invited to speak at the university church right here, in, right over in Loma Linda. And she said he talked for an hour on, I think she said, ecumenism and what the Jesuits are doing around the world. And when he got done, she said the pact University Church. I guess it holds several thousand people. 1,800? 1,844. Okay. She said that every single person in that church rose in unison and gave that man a five-minute standing ovation. What, what are we doing, folks? What are we doing? We're applauding? We're applauding the greatest enemy of mankind? You know, if we're applauding what the Jesuits are doing, that's because we're just like them. We're just like them. And that means we're not studying, we're not praying, and we don't have any idea what we believe. We have no idea. And that's why we can accept the great hoax, because we don't have a clue what the great controversy says anyway. So if the brethren say, this is a great book and we need to get it out, then we must do that. We're brain dead. That's being brain dead. God will have a people. God has people. You know what's interesting about Francis' apologies? Is they have to do with things that took place 500 years ago. Francis failed to apologize for his part in the dirty war that took place in Argentina from 1976 to 1983, in which 22,000 Argentinians were slaughtered, and over 100,000 Argentinians were removed from their homes in the dead of night and never heard from again. Now at that time when that occurred in 1976 to 1983, Pope Francis was the top religious authority in Argentina. He was the Jesuit provincial. And the man who led out was this man right here, Jorge Vidalia. He was the Roman Catholic dictator who slaughtered the people of Argentina and simply removed people from their homes in the dead of night. Probably because many of them were fundamentalists. That was their crime. They were fundamentalists. Jorge Vidalia, because of his crimes against the people of Argentina, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. He died in prison several years ago. The man who was responsible for what happened in Argentina? 
Bergoglio, he was elevated for what he did from being the provincial of Argentina to being the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church worldwide. Now, he didn't apologize for that. And according to the book Operation Gladio by Paul Williams, a devout Roman Catholic, Pope Francis, like all the popes since Pope Pius XII in the 1940s, every pope in the last 70 years has allowed drug money to flow through the Vatican Bank and then to go into Swiss bank accounts in Switzerland. And Pope Francis continues doing that today. That's why we went to Afghanistan after the September 11 attacks in 2001. It's because an Afghanistan leader by the name of Mullah Omar decided he was no longer going to grow heroin in Afghanistan. And so that's why September 11th happened. It was because the Catholic Intelligence Agency and the United States government and the Catholic Church and the Mafia had to continue growing that heroin in the Hellman Valley so that they could fund their terrorism all over the world. And Pope Francis, to this day, as we sit and stand here tonight, Pope Francis is dirtying his hands with drug money that continues to flow through the Vatican by the trillions of dollars. He didn't apologize for that, friends. There's the Vatican Bank through which the drug money flows. Now, let's take just a brief look at the elections going on in America. These two individuals at this moment are the front runners. Now this may surprise some of you, but of course Ellen White said that we are never to vote for a politician because what they do if we have voted for them, we become responsible for their sins and their uh, actions of inhumane, of, of inhumane works towards other people. So we're not to vote for anybody. We are to vote for issues, but not for individuals. Now that's what Ellen White says we're to do. But... Let's just analyze this for a minute. Donald Trump, of course, on the left side is a Republican. Hillary Clinton is a Democrat. Now, folks, since the 1920s, an organization was created called the Council on Foreign Relations. It was created by Edward Mandel House, who was a Rothschild Jesuit agent in America. And one of the goals of the CFR was to control both political parties. And friends, since the time of FDR in 1932, 95% of the candidates that have run from, from Roosevelt all the way to now have been a part of the CFR or some secret society. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are too. Both of the political front runners in the current election have secret ties to the Vatican. I remember last week when I was going to Spokane, Washington on Friday on the USA Today, it showed a picture of Francis and Trump. And Francis says, anybody that's going to keep out immigrants... It's, that's not Christian. And Donald Trump lashed out and said, I am a Christian. And so the USA Today paints this picture that these two men are at odds with each other. Oh, but they're working together, friends. They're working together. Donald Trump was educated 
at Fordham University in New York City. I'm sorry, York was left out. Not New City, but New York City. Fordham is one of the preeminent Jesuit universities in America. Many sources that I have seen, many reputable sources, among whom would be the man who wrote the book Vatican Assassins, declares that Donald Trump is a Knight of Malta. The Knights of Malta are soldiers for the Pope doing his bidding in the earth. So those are just a few little pieces of the pie that we call Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton, the Democratic side, she has ties to the Jesuit order through the Masonic order of the Eastern Star. She also held communion with Eleanor Roosevelt during her first control of the White House when her husband carried the title of president, Hillary Clinton held communion with Eleanor Roosevelt. So she has ties to the Jesuits through the order of the Eastern Star. She also holds communion with departed spirits, demons. So friend, as Donald Trump talks about making America great again? As Hillary Clinton paints pie in the sky that she's going to do great things for America, both of them will continue to follow the Jesuit plan to bring America back into the very lap of Rome. They're doing their work. Are we doing ours? Charles Chinnickley said there would come a time in his great book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, page 281 and 282, it says, We will not only elect the president, but fill and command the armies, man the navies, and hold the keys of the public treasury. He says here, what will those so-called giants think when not a single senator or member of Congress will be chosen unless he is submitted to our Holy Father, the Pope? Then, yes, we will rule the United States and lay them at the feet of the Vicar of Jesus Christ, that he may put an end to their godless system of education and impious laws of liberty of conscience. And what's going on amongst us as a people today? Within an hour to an hour and a half from here at the Hollywood Seventh-day Adventist Church, December 12, the first Seventh-day Adventist transgender elder is teaching Sabbath school in the Hollywood SDA Church. He or she declared, one wonders if the recent 21-page document released by Andrew Seminary paves the way for this kind of gender confusion into the church. So Andrew Seminary came out with a document declaring that if somebody has a leaning and, and are homosexual but are not practicing it even though they are a homosexual, that they can hold church offices, they can be pastors, and they can be leaders within the denomination. Now that came from Andrews, and this woman, former man-woman, said that it was because of that document that the Hollywood Seventh-day Adventist Church has allowed her to be a Sabbath school leader in the Hollywood SDA Church. It's this one right here. Yeah. The 
seminary document. I'll just read this second point here. It says, if I accept myself as a gay or lesbian person, do I have a place in the church? We are a church made up of sinners saved by grace with love as its foundation. Such love should be shown equally to all members. Gay and lesbian members who choose to, re to remain absti to abstinent should be given the opportunity to participate in all church activities, including leadership positions in the church. So maybe at some point, friend, if time lasts, this lady who is currently teaching Sabbath school in the Hollywood Church, she might become a president of the Southern Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And maybe even this one, Althea. The world is ripe for the picking, friends. The time for the truth to go like fire in a hayfield has arrived a long time ago. Within Adventism today, homosexuality is now an accepted norm. And Seventh-day Adventism does not know the time of her visitation. Where are the watchmen today? Where are the watchmen today, friends, that will expose what's really going on? Where are they? The pastor that you listen to on a regular basis, is he a watchman on the walls of Zion? Is he telling you what's going on? Or is he color-coding it, sugar-coding it? saying everything's okay when it's not okay. Friend, we're living in serious, serious times. I'm going to close with this slide this evening. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say to them, when I bring the sword upon a land, the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman. If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. I pray, friend, that we will not we will not accept we will not listen we will not give our time and our presence and our money to support apostasy. That we will demand, we will demand a watchman on the walls of Zion. And if we don't hear a watchman, that we will protest. And we will stand up and be counted on the Lord's side. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you this evening. Thank you this evening that you are preparing today an army an army that is going forward 
an army that is putting on their their shield and, and putting on their weapons of warfare and are engaging in battle to share the truth against all the lies and deceptions in the church and out of the church. Father, thank You that You will have a mighty army with King Jesus at its front. And they will go forth in might and strength and will be victorious. Father, I pray that each one of us would commit ourselves to You this evening. That, Lord, we would allow You to be the general of our hearts and our minds. That we would spend time, we would spend time praying and reading our Bible, reading the writings of Ellen White, so that we can be among that army that are going to win. Father in heaven, thank you this evening. Thank you this evening that we have the privilege to be a part of that mighty army that will win in this world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.